in the ether webs. Ah, awesome. Uh, and I'm, this is a topic that I'm always happy to explore. Uh, it's, you know, it's this ongoing conversation I'm having with myself and everyone I meet about storytelling stories and about my grandmother's work. Um, my grandmother was a rather uncommon grandmother. Uh, I was very lucky to have her and I'm lucky to still have her presence in my life. Uh, I live with a lot of her paintings and embroideries and it's just been a joy um, to visit UNH Durham and to see the exhibit. And for anyone who hasn't had a chance, I highly recommend it because there's nothing like being in the physical presence of artwork like this. It just comes alive. There's a freshness in that room when you walk in. I almost feel like I can catch the whiff of turpentine as if I was walking into my grandmother's studio. So it's a treat. So myths retold. One of the questions that people ask me uh, as a storyteller and also in relation to my grandmother's work is why myths? Why Greek myths? They're so ancient. They're old, it's true. But part, part of, you know, a big part of my response is, is that it's that ancient quality that makes them uh, so durable. They've lasted a long time, kind of like oil paintings. They, they endure um, and they're still with us. And they are because uh, the narratives have resonance for us on a personal level as individuals. They speak to greater truths, but they also speak to relationships um, and situations that a lot of us continue to find ourselves in, to find relevant, to be able to relate to. And that's something I'll get into more with this presentation, um, trying to get into that question of why Greek myths, why these stories, why did my grandmother explore them, what is so compelling about them, um, what makes them so durable, what gives them such incredible utility and flexibility, which is another really cool element. So yeah, so I'm wearing, uh, as Molly pointed out, I'm wearing a lot of metaphorical hats today. Um, I'm uh, here as an archivist. I've spent um, around 20 or so years going through the unpublished unpub uh, journals and works of uh, my late grandmother, Rosemary Beck, who I refer to as Becky. Uh, so you'll find me referring to her in that way at times because that was her family nickname. It was given to her by her husband, my grandfather, Robert Phelps, who was a writer. Um, and a Francophile and an editor, a journalist and a teacher. And he was he was a pretty considerable influence on Becky. They both did a lot of reading of literature and a lot of talking about what they were reading and writing about. Uh, so that's so that role of archivist comes through. Um, I'm also the collection manager for the Rosemary Beck Foundation. So I do a lot of work with um, managing the physical paintings and also our digital collection. Uh, if you're ever interested in looking at some of the uh, the works that we have online, as well as in person, you can uh, contact me directly, or you can also go through our website, which is rosemarybeck.org, and you'll be able to see um, virtual exhibits that we've done and, uh, and some of our collection to explore there. I'm also here as a storyteller, which I'm really excited about. That's very close to my heart. Um, I've been storytelling for most of my life and uh, very much inspired by my grandmother's work. I remember asking her early on as a child, what is going on in these paintings, these drawings of yours? What is happening? What is?" And she would tell me. And so she was one of the earliest storytelling influences in my life. And I kind of tore into a lot of these Greek myths and discovered, ah, oh, the Greeks aren't the only ones who have mythologies and stories that are worth exploring. So it, it kind of continued on and on and on and has come full circle in a lot of ways. And of course, I'm also here as a granddaughter. Um, and so here's to Becky. Thank you very much to her and to all of you. And I just wanted to point out that this is my grandmother's centenary year. She would have been turning 100 this July. So it feels very celebratory. Uh, to kick off the year in this way. So I am going to start my PowerPoint presentation that I created so I can share some beautiful images with you of work and just kind of give you a little background of what we're looking at. Here. Uh, and let's see if I can do this. Right. Myths retold. 
So as I always like to say, um, Greek myths, all, like all myths, a lot of these old, old stories, they're just, they're recognizable. We know them. Um, sometimes it seems like we can't even remember the first time we heard some of these versions, but imagery from the stories, imagery and um, snippets of the stories float around in our culture. They're very familiar to us. And it's a kind of a, it's a little bit of a shared vocabulary, our stories um, that we tell and that we all kind of know and have heard of and are familiar with. So that's a really significant element. Um, and they're fun. That's my personal opinion, but I think a lot of people feel too. Stories are a wonderful and fun, entertaining and engaging way to share information, which is what we humans are all about. We're always about communicating and sharing. So let's take a dive. So who is Rosemary Beck, first of all? For those who don't know her, she was a painter, an artist. She started out doing a lot of abstract expressionist paintings. She was very steeped in that in her early 20s. Um, that was, you know, the art du jour. That was what was on trend at the time in the 50s. And then in the mid 50s, she had a bit of a crisis. And this kind of thing started happening with her paintings. Faces and figures began coming through and she got, it was almost like she couldn't stop it. And before she knew it, she she pretty much gone figurative. And she took a fair amount of flack for that, but it was inevitable for her. And that was the direction that she went in. So here's a few examples. And then, you know, not only did she go figurative, but she went, she took it even further and her paintings really became what we would call narrative in that they imply and tell stories. And that pretty much from the late 60s, early 70s on, her work can, can be pretty solidly described as narrative. And that covers certainly um, the paintings that are on view at UNH right now. That would be, that covers a time period that many would consider to be kind of Becky at the height of her powers in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, when she really dug deep into these uh, different stories and narratives, many of them from Greek myths, but also from the Tempest, as we can see the lower right area there, uh, Ariel's Kind, that is from her Tempest series. She spent five years in the late, in the mid late 70s working on the Tempest. And that was not unusual for her to take her time and take that amount of time to work on a particular story or series or narrative. So then we get into the question of, of, of why. And so I decided to focus in on one particular narrative um, that is featured uh, at the UNH show. And that is the story of Antigone. And it's a story that's familiar to many of us. Um, but the question that was that's always been in my mind, which I've been working on answering, is why? Why Antigone? And why at the time in Becky's life did she choose to paint from this series? And she did spend a solid five years working from Antigone. Um, beginning in around 1987 or 1988, this is me with my archivist hat on, I have some quotes from her unpublished journals that give some insight into what was going on there. And she talks about Antigone and she has this wonderful phrase of having a bit of the novelist's delight. And of course, the novelist in her life who she knew, the writer was her husband, Robert. So, and she knew a lot of other writers too um, and corresponded with many of them. So that was sort of not an uncommon way for her to describe it. And her description, her use of the phrase Roman à clay, I think is really key because uh, I actually looked it up on Wikipedia because I was thinking, how do I describe this? How do I really get at this? And uh, the definition that I really liked was uh, for a roman à clé is a novel about real life events that is overlaid with a facade of fiction. And I think that's a great uh, way to describe uh, Becky's paintings in a lot of way. There's this overlay of paint. There's an overlay of a fiction and a story, but underneath that, there are deeper truths there's uh, and there's relational issues and truths getting at something that's really happening for someone. So on the surface, you may have a Greek myth, an elevated story, or this and the other, but underneath, there's something very personal that's driving the creation of these particular works. So 1988, 1987, that was when she was really kind of brewing, and 1988 was when she really just started in, as you can see with this sketch 
with you know plotting out and planning how she was going to execute this series with a number of different paintings and for her that always meant many many different sketches pencil and paper ink oil and paper all different kinds of things and then gradually growing into canvases of different sizes at this point um becky had been teaching at queen's college she was a professor of fine arts there um and she had been there for a couple of decades and 1988 uh that was about when she hit the age of 65. And for many reasons, she was been thinking about retiring from teaching full time. Uh, so that uh, that was on her mind. And there were other factors as well. There, oh, there's that quote, which I found. So here, are th these are what I think of as kind of three big influences on Becky for, um, for this series of Antigone and what was going on. And first and foremost uh, was her husband, Robert Phelps, who died in 1989. Um, he had been very, uh, he had a very aggressive form of Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease uh, and then was diagnosed with cancer. Um, and Becky cared for him at her in their home in their sixth floor walk up in the East Village in New York City. and in her journals, you can see that journey and how intense and difficult that was for her. Um, so that was a major issue. That was a major influence, I think, on the Antigone series is she was really delving into grief and loss. Um, and she did finally, shortly after Robert died, um, within about a year, she did finally retire from Queens and I found a photograph I don't have a lot of photographs of her, but I did find one that was taken on her last day of teaching. Uh, and that same year, uh, let, very soon after she had been widowed, some very close friends of hers, one of whom was a classic scholar, took her on a trip to Greece, which she had never been to before. And there's actually a, a photograph of her here, uh, which I love. You can just barely make her out. She always would wear that hat. And, and she, wherever she went, she was always sketching. And I have sketchbooks from that period. So this really helped to launch Antigone, the series, and get it moving. And then there's this quote here, which uh, I think relates to both Antigone and a kind of a cry from the heart about what it was like to see her husband decline and then lose him in this way. So when we think of Antigone, um, you know, here I'm wearing my storyteller's hat. Who's who's the prime storyteller who we think of who told the story as we know it of Antigone? And that's Sophocles. Uh, Sophocles was a playwright. So he really worked with words and he really envisioned um, actors telling his story. Um, so that was how he envisioned it. And he also envisioned the story of Antigone as very much part of his cycle about Oedipus who is Antigone's father slash brother. Um, and so Antigone, you know, he apparently wrote it before some of the other uh, other plays in his cycle, but Oedipus is really first and foremost, foremost in Sophocles' mind. Antigone is there in relation to Oedipus. And so he tells, you know, in the plays, he goes on at great length about Oedipus and his travails and his character and his this and that. and. And you can see, I have a few um, images here of other artworks that have been made um, in throughout history of Oedipus, and here's Oedipus with Antigone. And she seems uh, a little ancillary, in my view, in this depiction. Oedipus is almost larger than life, and she's sort of there. And here he is again, surrounded by his children slash siblings, um, and he's very much the focus. And of course, the other thing is that Sophocles, um, his telling of the story of Antigone and all of these related stories is uh, gets into a lot of political dealings. There's a lot of fighting. There's a lot of war. There's a lot of violence. There's a lot of men. <laughs> and a lot of what he was getting at with Antigone is uh, a vacuum of power in the city of Thebes, the ancient city of Thebes in Greece, and how various men were fighting over who was going to rule over Thebes. And so that is kind of a major theme for his telling of Antigone. All right, fair. That's one way to tell it. But it's not the only way to tell a story. 
And of course, as, as a storyteller, you know, and anyone who tells stories is a storyteller in a way anyone could tell you, not everyone tells the story the same way. So Sophocles could tell the story one way, but there are other ways to spin a yarn. All right, so there are Sophocles. Now we get Rosemary Beck, my grandmother. Uh, and she worked with words privately, but she primarily worked with paint. She was a painter. Um, and so what for her telling the stories, this was going to be the medium of how she was going to get her story across. Two-dimensional, but implying three, and really getting the narrative forward. There I am with her in my younger days. Here she is um, at a family function. And I, I think this is getting at where she was at and what her motivations were um, in telling this story of Antigone in her way. And I think she was very focused on family relationships and people um, and her sense of loneliness and sadness as a new widow. And so that those are the kinds of influences and that's what was sort of on her mind and in her heart when she was painting this story. So a very different place to come from than, uh, than our friend Sophocles. And that informs the quality of her storytelling. So, once upon a time. Once upon a time, there was a girl who was her own aunt and her name was Antigone. Antigone was born of incest as most of us know with the story. Um, and maybe for that reason, family was very important to her, family relationships, everything was kind of doubled down upon in Antigone's family. Her father was her brother, her mother was her grandmother, uh, her sister was her aunt, her brothers were uncles. It was, it was complicated, but her family ties were close and strong. So at the beginning of Antigone's story, of course, as we know it from Sophocles, her story is a kind of a after effect of earlier stories about Oedipus. Oedipus blinded himself upon the terrible revelation of his having killed his own father and married his own mother and had children with her. But that wasn't the end exactly of his story and his life. As he left the city of Thebes, he left a power vacuum, but he also still was alive awkwardly uh, and needed help. And so his, his daughter sisters, Antigone and Ismene, accompanied him into exile. And Sophocles actually tells, has a whole play that she tell that he tells about this strange aftertime of Oedipus with Antigone and Ismene accompanying him. And it, it, the play is called Oedipus at Konos, which was a town or a city that actually was where Sophocles was born. So that may have been why he decided to use that as the setting. And there Oedipus and his children meet Theseus, the great Greek hero, and he curses his sons and there's terrible trauma there. Meanwhile, his sons, Antiocles and Polynices, start a civil war over which of them will rule the city of Thebes, which Oedipus had left. It's a kind of a Game of Thrones situation where everybody loses. Eteocles and Polynices literally kill each other on the battlefield outside the city of Thebes. Then the only male who is left to rule is their uncle Cram, who was the brother of their mother, Jocasta. So he's, he's the only man left standing, so he takes over the rule. And the first thing that he has to deal with as king, the first rule or law he has to lay down to show his authority to the community is what to do with the bodies of these two young men, his nephews. Now, at the time of the fighting, Antiochus had technically had the rule of the city. And Polynices had gone... And this is another play of Sophocles called Seven Against Thebes. Polynices went and got six friends and drew together an army and attacked the city of Thebes, where his brother Eteocles was ruling. And so Eteocles came out, they fought, they killed each other. So technically, when they died, Eteocles was the ruler of Thebes, and Polynices was an upstart rebel who was fighting against Thebes. 
So King Crayon, newly crowned, decided that his first law that he would pass would be to give Eteocles a royal burial with all the pomp and ceremony that went along with the burial of a monarch. But Polynices, the rebellious brother who fought the city of Thebes, would be thrown and left out in the dirt outside the city to be devoured by dogs and birds of prey. Harsh. And to make sure that everyone understood that he was serious and that he needed to be taken seriously, Crayon decreed that anyone who interfered with this law and anyone who attempted to give any form of burial rights to the criminal Polynices would themselves be deemed a criminal and would be executed for defying the king's will. So this lays the scene. This is the introduction to the story of Antigone. And here she is in sketch form. And you can see immediately from the movement of her hands that she's talking. I don't know about in your family, but in my family, we do a lot of talking with our hands. You can't see necessarily in Zoom, but my hands are moving. And who is she talking to? Well, her sister is Mene, her other aunt besides herself. Now, one of the ways that Becky distinguishes in her paintings and her artworks between these two sisters is that Antigone is always the one who is calm, rational, and immovable. Her body gestures are spare and simple, but those of her sister Ismene are dramatic, very kind of over the top. Ismene was the one who expressed emotion volubly and volumetrically, perhaps. And so you can always see in depictions of the two of them um, that Becky has Antigone, who is calm and rational, and Ismene is emotional and, I don't like the term histrionic, but some might say very uh, dramatic. And so the two of them are disputing what to do about their bo the body of their dead brother Polynices, and Antigone is firm. There is only one way as far as she can see, and that is her brother's body must be given proper burial rights. He can't be allowed to be devoured out in the dirt by animals. And she herself has determined that she will go and bury him and clean his body. Ismene wants to follow the rule of law and order. No, we can't do it. It's a risk. It's terrible. What if we're caught? We can't. No, no, no. You mustn't. You mustn't. You mustn't. And they have this argument that goes on and on. And Becky had many sketches and paintings and drawings in which she depicted this going on. But for all of Ismene's cries and wails and demonstrations, Antigone stays firm in her resolution. There's another one that I love of the two of them. And you can see the movement. It's almost as though the air is moving. And again, you can see which is Antigone and which is Ismene. Their character really comes through. So here we see Antigone has followed through and she is at the side of her brother's corpse and she is cleaning him and preparing him for burial. And of course, her sister Ismene stands over and say, no, stop, you mustn't, it's too dangerous. And Antigone just ignores her. Even though, as you can see in the right painting, uh, the shadows of the guards that King Crayon has set loom and lurk. They are watching and it does not go unnoticed, her work. These paintings are moving to me because when I think about uh, this time period when Becky was painting them, it was not long after the time that she had been caring for my grandfather um, when he lay dying in their apartment. And so the act of, of cleaning a person who was close to death or, or after death would have been very familiar to her. And I imagine that she would have brought that to these depictions. These are very intimate as I imagine them. This is a painting um, that my grandmother gave to me and it shows Antigone burying her brother, uh, 
cleaning him in preparation for burial. Her sister, of course, is trying to stop her and Antigone won't be stopped. There is the dark shadow of a dog near the corpse that you can see. So the, the threat of what could have happened to the body is very real. And there is also the threat of the armed guards who are watching. And in Sophocles' version of the story, Antigone comes night after night to clean and wash and prepare her brother's body and to bury him. And they are dismayed. They don't know what to do. Um, they fear reporting her to the king because they know that justice will be harsh. And there's, there's this delay and a, a, almost a passive resistance implied. But eventually, eventually justice comes for her, at least the king's justice. Here's another painting of Antigone preparing and washing the body of her brother. And you can see again the animals that lurk and the guards. Um, there's, I believe in the background, um, the guards are carrying the body of her other brother, Eteocles, who's going to be properly prepared for his funeral. And so there she is taking care of Paul Nices. This painting is also um, in the private collection of another family member. And again, I, I feel this intimacy of this act of caring for um, the beloved flesh of a beloved family member. That feels very intimate to me. Eventually, after several nights of engaging in this illicit and illegal activity, uh, Antigone was arrested and taken before the king to face his justice. And this becomes a major part of this series. Uh, this, what Becky called Antigone before Crayon. This is where she faces his justice, but it's also where he faces her justice in a sense. And it's another long disputation between family members because she's his niece, he's her uncle. Um, Ismene is there watching, Crayon is gesticulating. And um, in this beautiful embroidery, which is not done justice at all in this photograph, it's hanging at the UNH show where you can see it in all its glistening, luminous glory. But what I love about this is how you see the characters um and even though they're two-dimensional you can see their motivations is many of course is in movement there's the flowing movement of her garment and her body is poised at the left frantic but helpless there's the guard who looks uh, very kind of torn about all this i don't know is this right <laughs> you know the it's the the point of view of that person who's just doing their job, but maybe doesn't feel so great about it in that moment. Then there's Antigone herself and her uncle Crayon who, who seizes her wrist and remonstrates with her. One element that I love in particular is as, as many of the students pointed out at the show opening, um, Becky often, you know, usually pre she showed her characters as contemporaries. People aren't wearing, um, chitons and Greek robes. They're wearing 20th century outfits like you'd find in the 80s. And Crayon the King is depicted as a sort of a, a 20th century authority figure, maybe the head of an art department or something like that, or a CEO. And, and it's that form of authority that he projects as he grabs her wrist. And she turns from him and says, no, your laws are not my laws. They're not God's laws. They're not moral they're not right and that's why i defy them do what you must over and over she painted this scene in different forms this collision between authority in the form of um your classic cis white man um and he's very much in the 20th century uh mode here and he uh he's angry and he's trying to assert himself and this young woman is just resisting. Um, I love that she wears sandals um, that are very similar to those that I remember my grandmother wearing. So I sort of feel that there's an identification going on there. A rebellious woman is Manny, of course, is still trying to remonstrate and the guard is uh, 
kind of helpless. What do we do? What do we do? Here's a few notes from her journals. Um, the sadness that pervaded this time for her um, invades the paintings to a certain extent. And this is just one of my favorites. It's a small work, but I think it's just beautiful and bright and I love it. So I'm sharing it with Antigone. Moving, turning, inclining, going her own way. And another of Antigone disputing with Crayon, resisting. They were at an impasse. She said he was wrong. He asserted his authority. Not knowing what else to do, he decided that he would let the law take its course and she had to die. But in a somewhat cowardly move, Crayon decided that he didn't want to be directly responsible for killing her. So he devised a particular form of execution with which to kind of get rid of her, to silence her, uh, this troublesome woman, without himself or one of his men committing a specific act of violence. And so he decided that the mode of execution would be immurement. He would literally shut her away. And this is another painting that is at the UNH show right now. This is Antigone being led to the cave. She will be locked inside, shut inside a naturally formed cave and left to die. And that is Crayon's judgment. Ismene over in the left is helpless but expressive. The guards, mm, I see them as ambivalent, but they're still obeying the word of the king, you know, the rule of law for what that's worth. And then Antigone takes things into her own, own hands, literally, um, locked away, left to die. Uh, she kills herself with her own couture. She takes a sash or a belt that she's wearing and hangs herself. And that is how she kind of has the final word in this story. In cert certain versions, Crayon is regretting his action. He's thinking, oh, I don't know. Should I have done this? Should I not? Uh, um, and he goes and he has the cave opened and she's discovered dead. It's too late. Another interesting element of the story is that Crayon's son, Haman, was in love with Antigone. And he's the one who finds and retrieves her body. And he's so angry at his father that he threatens the king with a knife. And as the king cowers and turns away, Haman turns the knife upon himself. And he dies with his lover. And here they are taken out. There is Ismene mourning. And the two lovers are brought out together before the king. And here's the king, Crayon, the 20th century CEO, uh, helpless in a kind of a Romeo and Juliet ending, your classic tragedy where the younger generation is destroyed and the older generation is left to contemplate the errors of their ways. The city of Thebes is off in the far left corner and, and uh, in Ismene, who is one of the only survivors, is left to grieve. And we don't know her story and I often wonder what happens with her. And then all that is left is a funeral cortege as the young lovers are brought to their final rest. And there, of course, is the same black dog that we saw earlier menacing the body of Polynices. And there is the hapless figure of Crayon gripping the uh, his scepter or spear of authority. Much good it did him. Uh, and that is the end of the story of Antigone. And it's... It's grim. It's tough. Um, it's it's truthful. And certainly we know that not all stories have happy endings. And um, we all have to face sadness and tragedy in our lives. And Becky was definitely facing that at this point as a widow um, and working through her grief, these family relationships, these feelings of isolation, what to do and where to go. That's a lot. I thought, ooh, I can't leave that there. I need to, I decided I needed to move to something a little bit 
uh, another story of hers where I can go in a slightly different direction. But before we leave the story of Antigone, I just wanted to share a reminder that ancient Greek myths are still with us in many forms. There are many ways to tell stories. Uh, there are ways to subvert tragedy and make it comic. And this is one that I particularly love, which I found on the interwebs. Enjoy Antigone in eight frames. It's truthful, it's accurate. It is, uh, it's a valid retelling, I think, of the story. And so that's sort of my way of inviting you and anyone and everyone to tell stories. We are all storytellers in our way. We can tell with words, images, however we want. There are many ways to do it. So another story that I dearly love, that's close to my heart, which is represented in the UNH show, is the, the ancient Greek story of Diana and Actaeon. Now, this was one that um, that Becky retold at a, at an, or a slightly earlier time. Um, she worked on a, a number of Greek myths uh, that were from Ovid's Metamorphoses during the 80s before she got to Antigone. Um, during the 1970s and 1980s, Becky and Robert uh, were lucky enough to have close friends who had a beautiful home on the lovely island of Martha's Vineyard. So many of those summers in the 1970s and 80s, they would go to Martha's Vineyard and he would write and she would paint. And this is a rare photograph I have of her around 1981, which is very close to the time that she would have been painting um, her, her version of the story of Diana and Actaeon. And of course, here's, here's Ovid. Uh, Ovid was a, a Roman writer who was exiled from Rome, which made him very, very sad. He was sent far away where he didn't have access to good public libraries. Oof, that's something I could relate to. Um, so there he is thinking and pondering and writing and retelling a lot of wonderful Greek myths. And here is Becky painting. As I said, storytellers come in all different forms. There are many different ways to tell a story. So the story of Diana and Actaeon is a very well-known one, and it has been uh, retold by painters in particular many times over the years. Um, this, uh, um, and I apologize for the blurry view, this was by Veronese, who was one of the great Venetian masters that Becky would have studied. And she, you know, in, before the age of, of internet, um, she and many artists that she knew studied reproductions of paintings like this in books and also went to museums whenever they could. So um, she was very familiar with the work of the old masters and really uh, respected this work, wrote about it in her journals. And in particular, in 1970, one summer, when she and Robert were on their way to Martha's Vineyard, they stopped in Boston and went to the Museum of Fine Arts, which is where she first saw this painting in the flesh, so to speak. She'd probably known it in reproduction, but here she got to actually view it. And she describes in her journals how much she enjoyed it. She said, terrific small Veronese landscape with figures, about 10 in each picture. Everything is arranged. And it's true, there is a very stylized uh, style uh, to this painting. Um, the more of these paintings and versions of Diana and Actaeon I see, the more it sort of feels like an excuse for a lot of these guys to just paint a lot of naked ladies, which was a popular way to paint, it still is, and that's fine. Uh, for those who don't recall the story of Diana and Actaeon, as originally earlier told by Ovid, um, has it, um, the way it's often told is a hunter called Actaeon, seen here in the red tights, um, is sauntering through the woods one day when he happens to come across a bevy of, of beautiful babes bathing. And he thinks, oh, how wonderful. And he kind of uh, arranges himself for like a, for a long and happy gaze, ogle. Uh, but what he doesn't realize, unfortunately for him, is that among these women is the goddess Diana, the goddess of the hunt, the virgin goddess who had sworn off all men. And she's very offended by his gaze. And so she punishes him by splashing him with water so that he turns into a stag whereupon he's hunted down and killed and devoured by his own dogs, who are these little goofy white whippets here. 
Um, it's very hard to tell looking at these naked women who is the goddess. The tell here is the hand about to splash Acteon with water. So that's really the only way you can tell. A lot of other artists decided they, they wanted to try their hand at this story. Um, and again, you see this theme, it's very often just a lot of naked women and then a very robust hunter who comes along to enjoy a look. And you know how angry are they? It's sort of hard to tell. Supposedly in the story, they're angry. Here, Diana is distinguished by the fact that she has a little a moon, a crescent moon on her forehead and she's about to splash him hard to say how angry she is in this depiction, even though supposedly in the story, she's offended by his looking. <sighs> I don't know. It's hard not to look at this from a 21st century perspective and wonder what's really going on. Now, here is another fantastic depiction, and this is one that Becky was definitely familiar with. Uh, she studied it extensively in reproduction, the great Titian and his Diana and Acteon. There's a lot going on in this painting, and it's problematic for many reasons. There's a marginalized woman over here in the corner um, who really kind of is an indicator of the systemic racism and colonialism that was going on at that time and that unfortunately is still with us. It's very easy to overlook this unnamed person in the painting and there she is. She's the only clothed woman in the painting, which is very interesting. And there's a lot of important articles that have been done analyzing this. Hmm. Well, Becky took a different uh, tack. She told this story differently than how these, than how her, uh, her peers, her earlier male peers did. Um, she just, uh, she saw the story in a different way. She portrayed it in a different way. Um, and it starts, as I would tell it, more along the lines of this. Once upon a time, a group of women were swimming and minding their own damn business. When along came a stalker who decided that he wanted to stare. The women were made uncomfortable and he wouldn't leave. And he came closer and closer and closer, even as they were dressing. And finally, Diana decided to uh, take care of this fellow in the way that seemed most suitable. If you act like an animal, maybe you really are an animal. So she turned him into a stag. I imagine that some of the last things that Acteon thought at this moment were, but oh, wait, I'm a really nice guy. I love this sketch also. There's Diana and there is her handiwork. The man turned into a stag and she seems rather proud. And here's the beautiful work that's hanging in the UNH show. And there is Acteon. And again, the students uh, noticed how um, Diana is wearing a 20th century bathing suit. She's not nude. She's not, um, she's not there simply to be ogled. She is the commanding center of this narrative. It's really about her. Acteon is, he's an animal and he's leaving the frame and you can see that he is surrounded by a bevy of beagles. And they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> so that's, that's the story of Diana and Acteon. There's an interesting little coda here, which is that um, 10 or so years later after executing that series, Becky actually um, studied the Titian painting that we were looking at earlier and did a few um, versions of it on her own, just, just kind of for fun. And I love the kind of abstract quality of this and similar paintings that she did, very small oil. Um, you could look at this and almost not see the figures if you chose not to, but there they are. That's her homage. And of course, Greek myths, they remain eternally relevant. There are many ways to tell the story. 
Uh, I even found this fantastic little Lego animated version, which you can find online. It's through Peep and Tom Productions. They made this terrific little animation series about Diana and Actaeon. So there's a lot of different ways um, to tell a story, a lot of different ways to spin a yarn. And I think now I um, I'm hoping that uh, there's time for anybody, if anybody has questions or wants, uh, just wants to know more, uh, I'd be happy to engage and see what people have to say. Great. Thank you, Doria. That was wonderful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, folks. Um, at first, I thought we could put some questions in the chat, but I think if, if folks want to, we may be able just to, um, you know, unmute yourself, turn your video on, and um, and just speak to the group. So I'm reading chat, letting people in at the same time. Um, Doria, I, I have a question, and then I did just see another one kind of in the chat, too. Mm -hmm. um, so let's start with the chat first. So Pam asks, um, please say how many paintings and embroideries are in the current show. Uh, there are 17 paintings and two embroideries currently in the show. And they are stunning. Uh, they're arranged beautifully in kind of narrative clusters, which I really appreciate. So you can really see how they go together um, to help create the flow of the story as Becky saw it in each case. Um, and the embroideries are just luminous. They're, she used a kind of a silk thread, um, which just can't quite be captured, I don't think, in a lot of photographs. So it's just, it's really worth seeing. It's a very unique um, and painterly depiction um, through thread. Sorry, and I, I have a few questions and I'd like to just start. The first question is, you, you shared so much about this very about Becky and, and your family, and I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what it's like to navigate that deep emotional connection to Rosemary and Beck's to her history, which is your history and your family stories, um, and then also work in, say, this capacity where you're speaking about her work, uh, maybe not objectively, but um, in a different capacity, and just how you navigate and manage the emotional connection with all of the professional players as well. Mm. Yeah, it's tough. I, um, I, I, because I knew her and I remember her so well, and um, we had this closeness, uh, especially when I was a child, um, that kind of looms a lot. And yet, uh, having been able to read her journals and correspondence, it kind of gave me a new view on her, on my grandmother as a person uh, and as a person, you know, that I didn't really know fully and appreciate when I was a child. When I was a child, she was just my grandmother who was really cool and who had these amazing artworks that she produced. But when you're a child, your, your close family members, you sort of take them for granted. And I kind of thought, oh, you know, this is just what a grandmother does. You know, this is who my grandmother is. And it wasn't really until a lot later and after she died that I really came to appreciate more um, her thoughts and her her work and her impact uh, as an artist. Um, and I started to learn more about her work as a teacher as I've had some amazing exchanges with former students of my grandmother's and that's been really incredible because they're almost like family members. They were almost like children to her in many cases. She really, um, her, connections to her students were so significant. And that's something that we we talk about a lot at the Rosemary Beck Foundation um, in preserving her legacy is her paintings and her artworks are obviously a critical element of her legacy. But another part is what I like to think of as her values, which come through a lot, I think, in her teaching and are kind of lived out today in, um, in the lives of her students, many of whom are active as artists and teachers themselves. Um, and so I feel that that's a really meaningful and rich 
element of her legacy is the teaching that continues. Um, and so, the, yeah, so that has helped to give me, even though I can never be fully objective, I recognize that, but that's helped to give me another perspective other than just my own perspective, because my own perspective on her is sort of limited in a way, or at least it was until it was enriched by hearing so much from other people and, and reading her words and kind of getting a sense of her own voice. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Two more questions came in the chat. So first from Pauline. Ms. Doyer, can you comment on the courage it took for Rosemary to forge and persist on her own path in the climate of contemporary art at the time? Oh yeah, that's a great question. I think it I think it was a very tough and lonely road to take, especially when she uh, quote unquote abandoned abstraction, which was seen by many as a kind of a heresy. Um, and I think as a woman in particular, uh, moving into more figurative and um, uh, and narrative artwork was was kind of looked down upon for a long time until more recently when I think there's been a, I think in recent years, there's been more of a reevaluation of the artwork of women of the 20th and 21st centuries, um, looking back and kind of really considering um, the contribution of a lot of women artists of that time, both abstract and figurative or ob objective, non-objective. Um, and I think a lot of those terms we're starting to see as somewhat um, not arbitrary, but very much kind of set up um, by mostly male art critics of the mid 20th century who were kind of trying to create and control the narrative of what is art and what is American art. And you know this idea of the New York school and that kind of thing. You know, one of the students at the UNH show pointed out that her brush strokes looked to them um, kind of almost abstract. And I agree. I think uh, her painting style was very informed by that earlier time. Um, and those early teachers that she studied with like Robert Motherwell in particular, um, and it carries through. And that's why you can sometimes almost read some of her works, her later works as abstract. I think she sort of, in her own mind, a lot of those, barriers and distinctions kind of dissolved. Um, this idea, um, sort of like in the in the classical music world, the the arguments about, you know, atonal versus tonal have come to seem a little like almost trivial. So like, it's not so much these genre differences that matter. It's really about the art and how, how compelling is it and what message is it trying to send and how, how effective is it at reaching us? And I would I would argue that Becky was very effective at getting the power of her vision across. Um, and whether it was done through abstraction or through figuration, it really just became figuration and narrative work is just that that was just the mode that worked for her as an artist. It wasn't a political choice for her, as some might have speculated. Like during the 80s, she definitely took flack from people in that ways, but it wasn't a political choice. It was really just an artistic choice. And like Antigone, she stuck by her truth and she was not to be moved um, in terms of what was fashionable or what was politically correct or what was this or that or the other at any particular time. She painted as she saw it and as she was moved to paint. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maybe those were some more of the questions that came up in the chat. That was a great. That was great to hear because that is also something I had been wondering about. So I'm glad I'm glad a question came in about that. Um, so the next question is from Nikki, um, who is a fellow here actually at the Museum of Art and has been working with the exhibition mm. about the semester. Nikki asks, how do you think the size and scale of the pieces impact their effect on viewers or the narrative in general? So did she always work on as grand canvases or is it just some of the, the series in particular in the mix? Mm, that's a great question. And um, having access to her collection, what we find is that um, you see that there, for, almost, for every series that she worked on, whether it was Antigone or Orpheus or The Tempest, Diana and Acteon, you see very, very large oils, um, but also, 
mid-size and small uh, studies and sketches that kind of accompany or work up to the oils. And as I mentioned earlier, she would sometimes spend as much as five years working on a particular theme or series. And during that time, she would create work of a huge variety. And sometimes she would take quite a while, like up to a year, to complete a really large canvas. But at the same time, she would be doing little sketches like pencil and ink in a sketchbook everywhere she went, whether it was on the subway, faculty meetings, traveling. <laughs> she always would bring a little sketchbook and she was always sketching, 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 either sketching people around her or just sketching out thoughts and ideas for work. Um, she even actually uh, has a copy of um, uh, for some of the different plays that she worked from by uh, Sophocles or Euripides, then she would sketch in the margins on her little books for the different scenes, sort of sketching out how she would want things to go. But then around the dinner table at home, she would be sitting and chatting with Robert or with friends or a student or maybe myself or my father, and she would be stitching away at an embroidery like the one that is behind me here, um, very casually. So she was constantly when she was in a mode of working on a particular narrative, she would be working it out in all different modes, scale, size, media, um, pencil and ink, maybe a watercolor or gouache, um, maybe an oil and paper, uh, stitching away in a little embroidery, and then also a really large canvas or smaller versions. She would work and shift around the composition. Maybe does she want Ismene here? Does she want Acteon on this side or here behind? So she was constantly working those out in a variety of sizes. And um, in the in a collection, you know, if you if you browse, if you, for instance, went to uh, rosemarybeck.org and you uh, browsed our digital collection, if you put in um, Antigone, you would start to get a sense of the of the variety of types of media and scale and size of the work that she were that she uh, executed during that five year time that she was working on Antigone. Just as a follow up to that, was you know you just said how she's working in all of these different sizes and shapes and, and mediums. Mm -hmm. Was painting always the end goal? For example, some of the large pieces we see. Is it always all of those other methods in pursuit of the painting, or um, did it just sort of happen as it came to her? Oh, that's a great question. It's very easy to um, to think that the large canvases are kind of the ultimate goal, goal of the be all and end all. Um, and yet some of these, the smaller works are such amazing standalone gems uh, that it's hard not to see those as just kind of perfect and right and finished in their own way. Um, I, yeah, I'm I'm hesitant to sort of to always define finishing through scale and size and to say, oh, well, the really the 60 by 50 canvas is clearly that's the last word. If you look at the dates of a lot of the paintings, you'll see um, that they don't always necessarily even go in that kind of order. She continually revisited different scenes and went back to them. So the largest canvases weren't necessarily the last word in her thinking on a particular scene or element, and she would come back. Um, you know, even the fact with with uh, with that reproduction that she, that little painting that she did, the transcription, as she called it, after Titian, um, that was 10 or so years after she had pretty much supposedly completed her Diana and Acteon series. But then, you know, she saw Titians and she thought, oh, and she thought it'd be fun. And she did several uh, transcriptions of his version of of uh, Diana and Acteon. So what is what is done, what is complete? Eh. Um, yeah, and then she reserved the right as as you can do, especially when you're working in two dimensions when you're as a painter to go back and go, oh, you know what? I'm, I wanna flip that, I wanna try it in a different way. Uh, and so you see that a lot. Yeah, thank you. Um, some more questions or comments put in, and I just want to make sure we get to all of them. So, Delia says, Thank you, Doria, and, and the UNH Museum. I, I got to see some of these paintings, and I was really struck by the Orpheus mm. and Eurydice, which brought back memories of the film that I once loved. 
and she got into film studies because of it, um, Black Orpheus by Marcel Kuhlman. Ooh, oh, that's marvelous. Ah, oh, yeah. I, you know, this is the thing that's so wonderful about some of these, mm -hmm. these mythic narratives um, is how it's not necessarily just that how universal they are per se, but how I would say relatable they are, is that so many different artists have taken them and can take them, and I hope will continue to take these narratives and retell them, re-spin them. Um, you know, the profusion of of comics that I've found that deal with some of these narratives is I find very inspiring and really interesting. And of course, film, you know, the film versions are fantastically beautiful, both two-dimensional and three-dimensional. I mean, it's it's marvelous. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's fantastic um, to be able to immerse yourself in these narratives and, and come at them in different ways. I know for myself, when I'm preparing a, um, a story for performance, I try and find as many different versions of it as I can. Not because I'm trying to necessarily copy one thing or another, but I just, I that feeling of immersion and the sense of, of connectedness to all the different artists and the different people who have told or retold a story in a different way through music, through art, through film. It's inspiring, it's wonderful. And it's what keeps these stories alive. We keep these stories alive by telling them, by painting them. And so, yes, tell on. <laughs> so, uh, we have some more comments. And I know folks can, you can read those comments and thank you. And, and then Catherine says, living her, truth, living her truth was one of the greatest lessons. By example, she gave her students and also I believe her audience. Um, and I think there's a question at the end, so I'm just going to read through. Um, Mary Beth, Betsy says that I've seen the show and was blown away. I especially love the Phaedra paintings, but now I can't wait to go back and do the Antigone, Antigone series again as your interpretations and narrative is really meaningful. Thank you. Oh, um, thank you. Hmm. I, oh, I agree. And I just I think want to Pam mention also. Have a, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, on on our website, we have a, a virtual viewing room where um, where we have a few uh, kind of online virtual exhibits that you can browse. Um, you you just sort of you plunk in your name and your email address, and then you, you can browse. There are several of them, and there is one from a year or so ago um, on Fidra that we did in the RBF studio space in, in Manhattan. Um, we hung that show for a while and we kind of digitized it so that it can be viewed. And that's sort of a deeper dive into her Phaedra works. And there's some writing there too for anyone who's interested in that. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, Colleen, thank you for that message. And um, Pam says, I loved Rosemary as a teacher and a painter and, and you, Dory, added so much to my understanding of your grandmother's works. So thank you for presenting this and to you, Nate, so thanks. And Pam, oh. did you have a question that you wanted to ask? I thought that you put your video on so she would give you the opportunity if you did. You don't have to, that's okay. My questions have been answered. <laughs> thank okay, you. Great. Good, thank you. Thank um, you. I want to especially thank UNH and everybody who did just a stupendous job with hanging this show, putting it together, um, and the student involvement. I'm just, I'm so impressed by this particular exhibition. I just think it's so marvelous. Um, the energy I got from the students at the opening, um, the interpretations um, in their writings, I think are just fantastic. And it really helps, it helps the artwork to live on. It helps the stories to live on. And I just think it's a really unique and marvelous way to present art. And I mean, obviously I'm biased as a storyteller and as Rosemary Beck's granddaughter, but I just think that this, this show is really, really special um, and is infused with just amazing energy and thoughtfulness. And I highly recommend visiting. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, and thank you to the team here and our director, Christina, who um, did the curating work and, yes. and all the the narrative, um, how to stream it, sort of narrative sections and yeah, put that together in that way and, and really brought something to the show yes. that I think, and I can say students connect with, like, for example, we had, I had a class come in right before this program and 
um, a nonfiction class, an intro to nonfiction. So we do some close looking and, and then I'm just sharing this with the group too, just how the narratives, like you were saying, um, they they are relatable new and through this method of just a visual analysis invites students maybe and I would say half of them hadn't even heard any of the myths and portrayed which is great and fine and we're just purely going on intuition and which painting spoke to them and that's the one they chose to work with um yeah. and then just what they're coming up with and what their reflections and their reactions are I found that it it's a whole different level of closeness to the paintings and the works and the stories that they're yeah. saying. And, and like you said, the students in Classics um, 601, The Power of Myth, I was amazed by, by the work that they did as well and their passion for it at the opening too. And some have come in in classes too and very sheepishly, you know, will point out like, oh, that's me. Um, like that's that. my name and my label. Yeah, but you can see that they're proud and... Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that to the group. And then if you do have the chance to come up to Durham to check it out, uh, please do. Mm, yeah. Yeah, their insights are just remarkable. And mm -hmm. it, it speaks to the relatable element of the stories. And also, I think, how effective the paintings are at getting across the narratives. But the narratives aren't dry and static. And the fact that they were also rooted in something very personal um, it gets back to that Roman uh, clay concept where there's there's kind of a veneer of of you know supposed fiction you know there's the story but underneath that is real feelings real emotions real relationships and that power generated is is really what comes through um, even in just two dimensions and people feel that even today and it's like the paintings are still alive they're still working they're still teaching and they're still telling. And so that was really, really amazing to see. So yeah, my hat is off to the students and the staff, everyone who worked at the museum and to Christina Durocher. Um, uh, so much of this exhibition is her brainchild and her, you know, a lot of her inspiration about how to do this. And it was a wonderful experience working with her um, to kind of try and envision it. So it's, it couldn't have happened without this kind of teamwork. And I really, that's phenomenal. So thank you to all. And thank you to everyone here for attending. I love, it's just such a thrill to be able to talk about this and share. I appreciate all the questions and comments. Thank you. And, and Mary, I just want to add one more comment and question of my own that I, I love the way that you framed these narratives like you know you're telling us that they're um the myths are enduring and they're real but then I love just like the comics the way you took the classical paintings and added these like very contemporary like pop culture ways of reacting with these paintings and um they're great like I'm trying to think can I can I borrow them from you for one more class yeah and yeah I'm happy it to share it. <laughs> yeah. it was um, so cool it you know it helps to frame it yeah yeah I just you know working on these that you know some of the themes are really intense and and really tragic and emotional and um but it's not without humor at certain moments and you know after really taking this intense deep dive doing all this research I thought oh what do people have what are people having to say about some of these stories now are they do people even know about them is it still a thing yes like just Thank you, Madam Google. Uh, <laughs> you can, you know, you Google these things, you search for them. It's like, wow, people are really working with this. You know, finding manga versions of Acteon and Diana um, and the Lego, it was the Lego version, the Lego uh, stop uh, animation that somebody had done. I, I thought, oh man, this is like, this is really it. This is the continuance. This is, it's the, con the story continuum that kind of goes throughout time that we're all connected to. Like these, these stories connect us to people in earlier times, to people now. They just keep telling and, and they help us to tell our stories too. Sometimes if you don't know how to begin, like how do I, how do I share my truth? How do I get at that? Well, there might just be a story that helps with it because maybe someone else has experienced this pain, this frustration, this situation that you're in. Um, 
I sometimes in workshops, I say that stories are kind of like recipes for hope. They're, um, they're possibilities, they're ways, they're scenarios, they're options for how to handle uh, challenges. And with, you know, it sort of shows here's what people in the past have done here, how they, here's how they've succeeded or failed, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. But we're not alone is what it comes down to. We're not alone. And sometimes it's just comforting in our own pain or our own processing to hear about a story and someone else processing something. It's right. even helpful to place ourselves and say, you know, it's not quite as bad as that. Yeah. Or maybe, but you know, just, just the relationship to it. Yeah. Um, so there's a few more quotes, or um, comments me in. Um, Pam asks, will I be able to get a link to this presentation? Um, should send it to some folks. So we will put this talk potentially on YouTube. Sorry to put you on the spot, Doria. Um, yeah, sure. Great, thank you. We were talking about it uh, before. Yeah. Um, anyway, just, just uh, with all the permissions and all of that. But um, so yeah, you will have access to that. If anyone okay. wants to connect with Doria, please just email me and I can connect you with her personally if you um, don't don't have her contact information. Um, and what I want to speak to just in our last minute is that another point you brought up so much through the presentation, Doria, about um, Becky, I never called it that, doing it here for the first time. Um, as a teacher, and um, I learned about her from her students here, some of who are on the call, and we are continuing the conversation of her work um, and in framing her as it, or her role as a teacher. So um, Professor Brian Chu will be speaking with Xiaopi Wang, artist and both former students of Rosemary. Um, that is coming up in a few weeks. Oh, next week, mid-February, February 15th. And then our fellowship students who have also been working with Rosemary's work and doing their own research um, will be giving a gallery talk if anyone um, is in the area and would like to come. So both Brian and Xiaoping and our fellows gallery talk will be happening on Wednesdays respectively, February 15th and February 22nd here at the Museum of Art. Um, and Ms. Ritold will be on view through April 1st. And if you'd like any more information about those programs, you can email me and they were also on our website. Yeah. So just thank you again, Doria. This has been so great. And um, what a wonderful way to spend our afternoon. Mm -hmm. And we, I learned so much. Um, yes, February 15th. Thanks, Xiao Kang. I'm looking at the calendar <laughs> behind me, it's glowy. Um, so, Again, yes, watch out for this recording. And if you have any concerns or questions about how to access it, please just let me know. And um, in closing, Doria, would you like to add anything else? Let's just keep the conversation going. Let's keep looking at art and telling stories. Uh, I think that's kind of, that's a big part of my grandmother's legacy is just in hopes for this continuation. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm inspired by all of you and uh, in your questions. And this has been great. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you again. And, and thank you all for coming. And we'll talk with you again soon. <laughs>